Think back to your time as a student learning math. Many of us went through math class afraid to get the wrong answer or bogged down by limiting beliefs about our own ability to do math well. How then do we create new math communities that are brave spaces where students feel safe to take risks and learn new things? I'm Steph from Heinemann, and today we're passing things over to Kent Haynes. Kent is a Heinemann Fellow alum and middle school math educator. He's joined by Lana Horn, author of Motivated, designing math classrooms where students want to join in. Kent and Lana talk about building a risk-taking community, acknowledging different strengths, and fostering learning relationships with students. Here's Kent with more. A few years ago, I read a book that seemed like it was tailor-made for a teacher like me. I was a few years into the classroom, and I had found a baseline level of competence in my math classes. I knew how to structure a lesson, how to work backwards from my unit test to plan out my sequence of topics. I knew how to get the kids to listen to my instructions. But I was also keenly aware that there was something more, something that I had seen in my students on occasion, which was true, honest engagement with the material. On certain days, my lessons just came together, and I could hear my students talking and sharing math ideas freely. Not every day, but every once in a while. And I was hooked. I wanted more. And then I read this book, Motivated, which gave me a way to think about what was happening in my classroom on those good days and what was missing on the bad ones. It had put into words the elements of a classroom of motivated students and given tons of examples from all different types of schools about how to create a classroom that gets your students motivated to engage with math. So I'm thrilled to be talking today with the author of that book, Alana Horn. Alana, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for that introduction. So I wanted to talk about the way that you introduce the book, which is with this anecdote about a teacher who sounds not that different from the way that I sounded in that introduction. It's um, Mrs. Uh, Goodenough, who finds this fantastic math task. You know, she probably came from some professional development. She saw this rich, engaging math task and puts it in front of her students. And when she tries it in class, the kids, they're silent, they're unengaged, uh, they're goofing off. And even the ones who engage with the material maybe privately are too embarrassed to speak up. And that class honestly probably sounds familiar to many math teachers, perhaps more than we'd like to admit. Um, Can you talk about what's going on in that classroom and what problem are you trying to solve with the book? Yeah, that's a great question. So Mrs. Goodenough is an amalgamation of many math classrooms, including my own, and just those lessons where it doesn't quite come together like you were describing in your introduction. As a part of my work as a teacher educator and as a researcher, I spend a lot of time in math classrooms all over the country. And I often am spending time in, in classrooms where teachers are trying to incorporate rich tasks into their teaching. And that lesson, that kind of dynamic is just something I see time and again, and it can be pretty discouraging for a teacher. They want to share the rich mathematics with their students. They want to give them an opportunity to have those moments of discovery and delight that can come when you're working on a rich task. But just getting the social piece together is, is a challenge that I don't think we've talked about enough in uh, mathematics education and in teacher education. So that was not to title drop or anything, but that was the motivation for me to write the book is that I just saw that as a missing piece of the conversation. We did a lot of work after the NCTM standards and Common Core and so on came out of developing really some really wonderful curricular materials, but we didn't give teachers enough tools to think about what kinds of conditions need to be uh, available in the classroom to really help those tasks take root. And I love this about your book, the amount of emphasis you put on that idea of social risk. I mean, I am a seventh grade math teacher. And so oh, yeah. I, I am teaching at the, <laughs> I have to say, probably the peak of heightened yes. sense of social risk going on. Absolutely. And and I think you're completely right that, you know, people say, you know, the best classroom management is a great lesson plan. And, you know, uh, you get rich tasks in front of these kids and they just light up and, and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And I do appreciate how respectful you are of the fact that there is sort of a monumental challenge of creating a place where being vulnerable in a mathematical setting, you know, being being vulnerable in any setting, but especially in a mathematical setting is something that is acceptable to to these students. I think that it's 
something that's sort of, you're right, it's a missing step, something that's elided by a lot of other teachers and a lot of other people who are focused on helping teachers improve their their teaching. One of the things that's so complicated about it is that what it takes to manage that social risk in your classroom with your particular students in your particular school may not look exactly like what it looks like in my classroom or in somebody else's classroom. So it's a pretty context-dependent set of practices, which requires a different kind of teacher skill. It's not like I can just hand you a a checklist and know that that checklist is going to work equally well in your class as it would in somebody else's. Let's talk about what that is because it's not a checklist. It's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, here's 57 things you can implement in your class on Tuesday, but it is an elaboration on these five important features of what you call a motivational classroom, a classroom where students are motivated to engage in the mathematics and and I love that that the way you're approaching it is to sort of create this framework and then say, what does this framework look like in all of these different classrooms? Four of the five components of motivational classrooms come straight out of the social psychology, educational psychology literature. That's belongingness, meaningfulness, competence, and autonomy. Those are things that we've known for a really long time uh, are components of when we see people motivated to engage in whatever activity, you'll usually find aspects of those things. The accountability piece was kind of a discovery as I was talking to teachers. And I think that um, the reason for that is that the social psychology literature really focuses on how individual people feel motivated to do things. And because teachers are conducting a community a classroom community and trying to get students to interface with each other. So there need to be a set of norms and kind of community structures that um, allow people to work together in a motivated fashion. That's why the accountability piece became um, important because you have to be kind of, you have to be beholden to a set of, of norms and expectations about what it means to be in this classroom. What does that look like in all of these different uh, teachers' classrooms? You know, what did what did you notice uh, in terms of common threads um, between some of these teachers that that you featured in the book? Let's just take belongingness as an example. I think at the heart of all of the teachers' practice was a real attention to making sure that students knew that they were welcome in their math classroom. And I think, you know, sometimes people say to me, "Well," how is this different than, say, an English language arts or whatever other subject classroom? And it's interesting, Kent, that you were talking about teaching seventh grade, because we know that middle school is when kids in the U.S., their confidence and um, like of math tends to drop off. And, you know, at that point, we've, like, introduced a lot of standardized testing. We've used math as a real sorting tool to label kids. We've given kids a lot of ideas about who is and who is not good at math. And so I think in math class in particular, kids come in um, with pretty clear ideas about whether or not they belong. And so seeing how different teachers created that sense of belonging for different uh, populations of students and different kinds of age levels and different kind of teaching uh, teaching environments. And to be honest, with their own different kinds of personalities, you know, some people really are more outgoing and, and gregarious, and some people are more quiet, and their, their superpower is a kind of quiet listening observation. There, there's a lot of different ways to create that belongingness. And part of what I was trying to illustrate by showing it through these different teachers, the the focal teachers in the book, is that it's not so much the how, but more the why of what we're doing. And that different teachers can kind of find their way of creating those conditions for their students in a way that's authentic to their own personality and strengths as a teacher, which I think is really critical for developing teaching practice. Yeah, I think it's so. I think it's so interesting um, to see, and wh- I, I like how you have these. I believe six teachers um, that that you've mm-hmm. highlighted, but you've also sort of sprinkled some great ideas that you found from teachers who aren't necessarily focal points of the book, but you just happen to bring up. You know, for example, one that I love and have used for several years now 
is um, Sarah Vanderwerf uh, has these name tents where she gets students to write a little note to her and then she writes a little note back on the inside of their name tent that she's using to learn their names. And so then, you know, by the end of the week, they've had five days of little notes passed back and forth. And I have found uh, that it is such a powerful tool, number one, for getting to know who these kids are, and number two, for getting them to realize that I want to know who they are. Um, exactly. Honestly, the first week of school, I try to have everything ready to go because I don't really have time for anything other than replying to all these comments. And yet I feel like it's such a valuable use of my time. And of course, if I had 170 students or something, I don't know that I'd be able to do that. Right. But I, because as you said, context is really important. But I do feel like it's it's doable for me if I have 80 to 100 students, you know, I can I can right. make that happen. And you learn so much from those uh, from those first few days. Part of the idea, too, is that by offering a bunch of strategies and tools, but framed around purpose and intent, teachers can strategically use their time because you're right, it it isn't sustainable even for one week to write 180 messages after school every day because if you spend one minute per kid, that's three hours. So this is perhaps a good chance to to move into the idea of competence because you were talking about these different classes. Uh, where you know some students maybe have been very successful in math in the past, whereas some students typically haven't. And mm -hmm. by the time you're in a secondary math environment, you've probably already been sorted into that sort of situation where you're either in a class where you are surrounded by a lot of people who have not felt very confident in math in the past or surrounded by a bunch of people who have. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that I think is really interesting about your work, you've written a lot about status within the classroom. Mm -hmm and the role that it plays in creating that climate or that culture within the room. So um, you have the sort of sense of, oh, this is a class uh, of people who have been sorted as, you know, not, not as mathematically competent in general. But then within that classroom also, you have the people who feel like they are particularly adept or particularly not adept at this topic or that sort of thing. And you have these social dynamics going on. Um, so, so how, as teachers... Do we, I guess, acknowledge the existence of this status and, and find ways to allow all of our learners, even those who struggle or take a long time to you know, understand a new topic, feel that they have access to that sense of competence in our classrooms? Right. So competence and status are really strongly linked, as, as you've uh, suggested in the framing of your question. Usually, a lot of times, I should say, in uh, school math we kind of have a hierarchy of who's good at math based on either standardized test scores or, you know, interactionally in class discussions around who can get the answer the quickest when a teacher asks a calculation question and who gets the answer right most frequently. So if you think about the entire field of mathematics, we kind of dilute the types of competence we value in school math to quick and accurate calculation, which is not only a poor representation of what mathematics actually is and entails, but it's kind of ludicrous in uh, a day and age where a lot of us walk around with computers in our pocket that are more powerful than the ones that launched a rocket to the moon in the 1960s. So we have supercomputers basically in our pocket, so quick and accurate calculation should no longer be what makes or breaks our views on mathematical smartness. And on the other side of that as well, when we look at the field of mathematics, when we look at the history of mathematics, we see that what moves the field forward isn't somebody getting an answer right quickly. It's the deeper understandings. It's making important connections. It's coming up with a elucidating representation. It's asking a provocative question. It's asking the what if questions um, that extend our ideas and understandings. And those kinds of mathematical competencies are often not valued in classrooms, even though we have a lot of kids who may not be quick and accurate calculators, but who can do those other things. So part of addressing status in mathematics classrooms is deeply connected to broadening our notion of what it means to be mathematically competent. And sometimes when I say that, 
people who don't listen carefully think I'm saying water down mathematics and make sure everybody feels good. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying make mathematics in school more like mathematics is for mathematicians. Um, make it more rich and make the things that those of us who've had the experience of working in um, mathematical fields, that what we like about it, those those experiences of discovery, of connection, of insight, that that should be more of a part of what kids get to experience in schools. And when we do that, not only are we making the mathematics more authentic, but we are also broadening the tent. We're saying, okay, so maybe you don't know your times tables, but boy, you were able to really interpret that graph in an illuminating way. You are really able to extend that pattern in a way that was really unique. And those are authentically mathematical skills. And so when we have this sort of linear notion of competence that, you know, the fastest and quickest are the smartest, there's not a lot of room in there for other people to contribute. It increases the social risk because you already know where you are in that hierarchy of quick and accurate calculation. And you know that so-and-so is the fastest and the most accurate. So why should you bother? But if you know that your ideas might have a place so that it's not just this linear hierarchy of that they're the smartest because they're the fastest and quickest, but you ask important questions, you make important connections, you sometimes come up with really creative ways to extend patterns, and that's an authentic part of the classroom culture, then those status dynamics that emerge from that linear notion of competence can kind of be complicated in productive ways and in ways that are more inviting. When I'm thinking about it, you know, it's funny you said that you that some people may interpret this as sort of watering down the mathematics, but I have found it to often be the opposite of the case, that it's in those moments where I push uh, students to extend their thinking that students who otherwise uh, might have been struggling can sort of shine. Like, for example, if I if I put a linear equation on the board and ask students to solve it, you know, students will, you know, do the same thing to both sides of the equation, you know, write the simplified equation, all that sort of thing. But if I ask the students to say, um, write a word problem that this equation could model, you know, including mm-hmm. an unknown value and, you know, whatever. So 2x plus 3 equals 13. I'm not asking mm-hmm. you to solve it. I'm asking you to write a word problem for it. Well, yep. I've taught long enough that I know that it's not going to be the same set of students That's who right. can solve that equation as who can write a word problem that connects with that. Because there are there are students who are struggling to understand the mechanics of solving an equation, maybe, but they see equations as expressing relationships, and they may be able to be creative enough and and sort of assign meaning to it in a way that uh, some students who have simply memorized the steps by rote can't do that. That's right, and part of what that alternative prompt does as well is it uncovers some really important ideas, like. How do you describe what a variable is? What does a variable look like in the world, right? And so that's a really, really crucial idea, a crucial mathematical idea that a kid who might know the mechanics may not yet be able to articulate. And that gives that child an opportunity to go, oh, okay, yeah, that's what X means. And maybe you get several examples from different students and, and across those things, other kids who are still making sense of the meaning of variable can start to generalize and go, oh, yeah, 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 okay, that's a variable, that's a variable, that's a variable. And it helps them make the mathematics more meaningful for kids who might just understand it mechanically. This really connects Mm -hmm. with the idea of meaningfulness. um, Absolutely. That that if if we focus our classrooms on the big, important ideas uh, of math at each grade level, there are more opportunities for students to feel competent because they're all grappling with these big ideas uh, at some level or another. And I, I guess one of the things that is helpful in creating a meaningful classroom is to sort of reverse it and create these question types where students are not asked necessarily to calculate anything, but just to make a mm-hmm. connection between one representation of a problem and another or that sort of thing. How how else do you, do you see uh, teachers being able to help students feel that the math that they're learning has meaning? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a number of ways to, to do that. I mean, one of the teachers in the book, Fan Nguyen, would find problems and kind of make problems with her students. There's a story I tell um, that came from Fan's blog about a time that they repainted the Foursquare court in the school 
uh, playground. And Fawn was like, ooh, I wonder how much more area it has now, right? And so she asked the question to her kids and they went out on the playground and, you know, she said, what what kind of information do we need? Because you could see the old lines where it was, you know, they painted over it in black and then repainted with the white lines. So you could sort of see still the trace of the old four square court. And she had a conversation with, with her kids and Fawn has the kind of relationship with her students where there's a lot of affectionate teasing. You're probably familiar with this as a middle school teacher yes. where, you know, it's like, Miss Nguyen, you see, you see math everywhere, you know, but they're, they're still doing it. They're still brainstorming with her about how to do that. And, you know, Rafrans Davis, another teacher in the book would just look around also and, and kind of find things like they had her, her classroom overlooked, uh, major road. And so they would play games about predicting the rate of cars um, going by the window. Peg Cagle, she liked to do silly problems, you know, playful problems with her students. So she had them, you know, race wind up toys. And and I, I think that, that that idea of playfulness and that idea of silliness and the sort of spontaneity and that math is not just some stodgy thing that exists in a textbook where you know, two trains leave Chicago at 4 p.m. and, you know, whatever, like those kind of problems that people always joke about. But like, actually, we can kind of do fun and silly and interesting things in the world with these ideas and, and make sense of things we see around us in ways that are interesting. All of the teachers did this in different ways, sometimes more through discussion, like Chris Lesniak and Elizabeth Statmore. Um, both had sort of discussion-based strategies that they used to help kids make meaning of the mathematics. So I think there's a modeling thing, there's a discussing thing. But I think that the idea behind all of these things is that kids can have some agency in using mathematics as a tool to look at the world and make sense of it and interpret it, and that it's something kids can kind of own and get their hands around and make sense of as they're looking and interacting with the world, which is what we ultimately want as math teachers. We don't want it to be something that they learn and forget. We want it to be something that they can take with them in their life and be critical citizens and thoughtful consumers and, and you know, um, informed patients and, and good citizens of, of making sense of science and all these different things that, that mathematical literacy has an impact on in, in terms of people's lives. That's what we want as math educators. So one other area that I was really interested in talking about is accountability. And the reason mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in discussing this with you is that in addition to having written this book, you've written a great deal about a lot of other educators and professional development resources for teachers that are very focused on accountability. It's not as though you feel that accountability is not an important uh, feature of a classroom. It's just that I think you have perhaps a little bit of a different way of thinking about it. And I'd love to hear you sort of expand on that a little bit. So I think it's important that for me, accountability is also coupled with student autonomy and meaningfulness, and that those things are important parts of the framework, especially when we're talking about adolescence, right? That part of the job of adolescence is to develop autonomy in the world and you know just developmentally speaking to feel like they can go in the world have some mastery over it be independent not rely on you know as they did when they were smaller the adults around them to help them navigate right that is one of the key tasks of adolescence so there needs to be accountability in the sense that we as a classroom community have norms. We have ways that are okay to talk to each other. And we have ways that are that cross lines that are not going to be okay. And that's really important for managing issues of social risk, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because even if you develop really great rapport with your students one-on-one -on -one because you take the time to do name 10 notes the first week of school, if kids are going back to their seat and being bullied, they're not going to take those risks in your classroom when you're trying to get up a really good discussion about some mathematical ideas. So there has to be kind of a degree of safety within the community itself. Also, just in terms of mitigating risk, there need to be norms around things like mistakes and that it's normal to make mistakes. That's what we do when we're making sense of things and that to get away from this idea that 
people who are good at math never calculate things wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Of course, I forgot my negative sign. Okay, no big deal. Let Let me fix that. Thanks for catching it. And let's move on. And I think that there's a kind of culture of nitpicky pedantry that sometimes people experience in math classes that makes them fearful to speak up. So that's what I mean by accountability. I know accountability is kind of a loaded word. I don't mean the accountability like assessment. And I don't mean accountability like especially high stakes assessment. I mean the way that we hold each other to a shared set of expectations as a classroom community. But the fact that that goes with these very relational things like belongingness and autonomy means I'm never going to just shame you into meeting those expectations. If I don't see you meeting those expectations or acting in a way that is supportive to our community, I'm going to respect your autonomy as a thinking, thoughtful, hopefully caring human being and have a discussion with you about, you know, when you use those put downs, I notice that other people are get shyer to speak up. So I really want to work with you to not have that come out because it makes it really hard for us to have conversations in our class. So that's very different than like a cold calling, I'm going to catch you not paying attention in class, and you have to be fearful in my class of being ashamed because I'm going to call you out and everyone's going to know you weren't paying attention. What a good moment that sort of sums up the, the big idea to the book here. It's not accountability. Like if you're reading this book looking for how do I hold my students accountable so I make sure they all do their homework, that's not at least directly in this book, but it's how do I make sure, like, how do I handle the fact that all the other students snicker whenever one of my kids uh, says something incorrect or, or what have you? This book is really helping teachers think through those, which are frankly much more challenging to manage, um, I think, as a teacher. And frankly, Absolutely. if you're getting these sorts of things right, the other management and accountability issues are really alleviated, uh, at least in my experience. You know, if you've got your connections with students and you have, if you have helped create this idea that we are a learning community, then, you know, there's a lot, a lot of students are willing to do a lot more than you might've expected at the beginning of the year. At least that's been, that's been my experience with this. Absolutely. I, I remember a parent coming in and saying to me, what are you doing in your classroom? He, he comes home and he, he just, wants to do his math homework. And that's never happened before, you know, and I'm not saying that happened all the time, because I can tell you about all the kids who didn't do their homework, too. But there are there are kids for whom just that connection and just that sense that you're paying attention is, is such a powerful inducement to do these things that we do as we do school, you know, and there are so many kids out there who are very, very relationally driven, much more so than they are Um, for some kind of distant outcome, some abstract thing of college or jobs or whatever that feels a million years away when you're 14 years old. My teacher's going to be excited and give me that stamp on my homework. That that's exciting. And that's going to happen tomorrow. And I, I like being a part of that, you know? Mm -hmm. And yes, I did talk about putting stamps on homework because it's amazing to me. Even my college students like stamps on their homework. There's, there's certain <laughs> things, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. Just a little, a little sticker, right? Like, uh, you know, it just makes you happy. I mean, they give us all as adults, they give us stickers when we vote. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I wear my little sticker and I'm all proud as I walk around on election day with my, I'm, I voted sticker, you know, like there's room for that too. It doesn't all have to be this abstract complex stuff. That's so funny. I really, I do need to, uh, <laughs> I need to get some stickers in my classroom. That's what I'm thinking now. Um, yeah. yeah, those those thousand sheet, you know those those ones with like all the little happy faces, and mm-hmm. different sparkles. Oh, absolutely. Which is so funny because again, context is key. Like I am not a smiley face sticker type of teacher, but I can yeah. find my version of that, right? I can, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, no, I I knew a teacher who had a real ability to find super weird things mm-hmm. like that like the very, very weird versions. And that was very much his personality. And kids loved it because he would have like pickles or, you know, just some weird, odd. Yeah, just (laughs) a pickle sticker. (laughs) sticker, You know, hey, 
hey, do I get a pickle sticker today? Oh my gosh, I, this is I love this. This is that that, and and I will say this is this is what I love about this book is I'm alternating between feeling this sense of oh look at look at how far I have to go. These that you ha- you end each chapter with these sort of audits, which is a chance for self reflection. You know, like do I have these features in my classroom essentially, right? And those are a real sort of dark night of the soul <laughs> for any teacher reading these <laughs> books, you know, because if you're going to be honest with not. yourself, no, but it's good. I, I like that sort of thing. I love to be reminded of areas where, you know, if I ever start feeling, you know, like, oh man, I really got this thing. It's like, oh, well, I don't have this aspect of it, right? I could really improve here, you know, that sort of thing. But it's also, um, there's so many ideas in the book that even if I don't take that particular idea, it gets me thinking about how I can find a way to make that my own and, and reach that same feature of a motivational classroom in my own way. And that's what I, what I really like. That's the goal. And, and let me tell you what I was thinking about with the audience. They were not intended to be a dark night of the soul. So (laughs) first of all, the way I think about teaching, part of what makes it amazing as a profession and part of what makes it daunting as a profession is you never figure it all out. Once I realized that, it was just kind of like this relief that washed over me. And it came out of watching a teacher who I really admire having a bad day with his class and talking to him about it afterwards. And, you know, just realizing, wow, you know, there's this guy who's got so much more experience than I did at the time and, you know, just had so many things I admired and just having a bad day. And part of what the reality of teaching is, is it's not all in our control. It's us in interaction with a group of kids who almost always vastly outnumber us, who are, especially when talking about adolescents, who are have all kinds of hormones surging through them, all kinds of social drama happening in their lives, all kinds of other issues and things that are worrying and concerning them. And you have this challenge of trying to meet them where they are and take them somewhere where you want to go with them. And it's sort of that push-pull. And some days you're going to click and connect, and some days you're not. And the world is always changing. So it's not even like, oh, if I do that enough times in 15 years, I'll get it. Because the world is always changing. If if the pandemic has taught us nothing, it's (laughs) it's that we all have these times where we have to be beginners again, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a new situation that has just washed out a lot of what we thought we knew. And um, I think that that's just actually teaching reality in a microcosm. We have these tools, we have these strategies, we have these goals, but we get these different groups of kids with different kinds of dynamics. And it's a lot of trial and error. So the idea of the audits was kind of, I think of them more as tuning instruments. A lot of professional development and a lot of books Um, I've seen add to teachers' repertoires. They give them tools and frameworks and things. And the most coherent classrooms that I've been in aren't so much about the things themselves, but about the sort of integration of the messaging. And so I wanted to give teachers something that could help them tune and figure out what components of all these different parts of the classroom, which are such complex spaces, may be working against some of these goals of belongingness, meaningfulness, competence, autonomy, accountability, et cetera. So that's the goal of them. And I hope, I hope people find them useful in that sense, even if it does sort of make you have that, oh, crap moment where you realize, shoot, I've been doing this thing and that is kind of working against this other thing I'm trying to do. That's that's just teaching. You, you <laughs> It's about trade-offs and dilemmas and doing your best and some things work really well for one thing and undermine another thing and you got to just go back to the drawing board. Right. And and so let's let's talk about a teacher who's reading this book and maybe they are are having that feeling of, oh, you know, not only I don't do a lot of the routines that some of these other teachers do, um, uh, you know, to sort of have like whole class discussions or, or, you know, counting circles or whatever these things may be, which, which um, may sound a little bit daunting. And maybe they feel like I've, I have perhaps a little bit more of a traditional or sort of like a button down style 
And I'm not super comfortable deviating that much from it, but I would still like my students to feel more um, motivated by the mathematics in my classroom. What do you think uh, a, a teacher who's perhaps coming from a more traditional perspective can still draw from this without necessarily radically changing the way that they approach their classroom? I think belongingness goes such a long way. And I've done some workshops with teachers where we really look at the belongingness in and of itself. And there's nothing radical about making sure students feel comfortable in your classrooms. Now, it may implicate if you do time tests or something like that, it may implicate some of those kinds of practices that do make kids feel pushed out. But I think that there are aspects of belongingness that should be in every classroom as far as I'm concerned. And one of the exercises I've done a lot with teachers in workshops that is at the end of, of, that, cl- of that chapter in, as part of that audit is what, something I learned from another teacher. Um, it's a roster check exercise. And honestly, I still do this in my own instruction at university level. Mm-hmm. where if a class is not quite coming together and you don't, you know what I mean? And you just don't quite know what's going on. This is one of the first things I go to. You take your roster and next to each student, you see if you can list one of their strengths, hopefully a mathematical strength, but maybe another strength if you can't get mathematical yet. And then you step back and you look for a pattern. Who is it that you're having trouble getting to know? And I have had teachers have that sort of, oh no, moment when they do that exercise. Like I I remember very vividly um, a teacher looking, sitting back and saying, oh my gosh, I don't know any of my quiet girls. And I remember another student, another teacher saying, I don't know my immigrant students, my students who aren't fluent in English, I don't know them. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about that, even though it feels bad to have that moment where you notice a pattern in your own bias, because we all have biases in your teaching, is that then that gives you a pathway of something you can do. And maybe there is no clear pattern like that. Sometimes there's clear patterns and sometimes it's just about personality. You know, like certain kids, you just haven't managed to connect with yet, but then that can become your project. So let's say you have a roster of 30 kids and you have five kids you really can't say much about. Well, if one of them never comes to class, that's a little bit outside of your control. But if the other four are coming to class and you don't know them, you can take the next couple of weeks and make sure you check in with them at least a couple times a week, look at their work a little more closely, stop by and listen to them during class discussions, make sure you call on them, and kind of correct yourself to the extent that you can start to get to know them a little bit more and make sure that they know that you you see them. Because chances are, if if you don't know much about them, they probably don't feel very seen by you. And that's not good for their sense of belongingness in your classroom. I'm really glad that there is so much that, well, frankly, any teacher can get just from that aspect of the book and really thinking critically about how to make sure their students belong. Because frankly, I know that there are students who have had really beneficial educational experiences in traditional math classrooms. And it's very often from a teacher that they loved. Um, And it's because they had that connection with that teacher who, you know, maybe presented things in a fairly didactic manner that happened to work with that student, but more so than that, had something in their personality that a student connected with. And so I think that 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 is at the core of what we are doing. Uh, This teaching and learning is a a social experience. And again, something that we learned from the pandemic is how attenuated that can become when you're doing it virtually. And I, I can't tell you how happy I am to be back in a room full of kids doing math. It's so different. It's yes. And there's just no there's just no comparison. So one last thing I wanted to ask you about, because this is a book that is trying to help teachers develop professionally, become better teachers, Mm -hmm. do a better job of connecting with their students and communicating mathematics with them. And I know that since you've written this book, another one of your major projects has been doing research about 
professional development and how to best structure professional development so that teachers really get something impactful from that. And, you know, speaking as a teacher who sat in plenty of uh, unsuccessful professional development, I'm very curious. We all have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very curious what your research around this has been about and, and some of your, your findings. So if you could just share what you've been, what you, what questions you've been asking and what you found out about it. Well, so we've been partnering with a professional development organization that works with math teachers. And when we built our partnership, part of the reason why we decided to work with this organization is they had math teachers, they met every month with them. And the way their professional development was designed, it kind of hit everything that the research literature says makes for high quality professional development. So we figured that by building out from a place that's already, you know, doing everything right, uh, according to what we know in research, we can learn what else can be done. But here are a few things that are important in professional learning that are not common features of professional development. First is engaging what teachers already know and think about a topic. Too often, professional development workshops are like, here's the latest assessment tool. Here's my strategy for getting discussions going. Here's this. And it's a lot of presenting, but not enough uncovering of how do you think about assessment? How do you think about leading class discussions? And especially when we're talking about in-service teachers, they already come to a professional development workshop with a lot of prior knowledge and experience about whatever they're coming to learn about most of the time. And too often, professional development just tries to add something to the toolkit. But it, we know about learning, just as a fundamental truth of any kind of learning, that the richest, strongest, most robust learning is going to build off of prior knowledge and experience. And we don't do that in professional development. The other thing that teachers really long for is thoughtful feedback about their actual classroom practice. And that's something else we know about learning is that effective learning requires a lot of thoughtful feedback. Think of any skill that you've learned, maybe something more recent as an adult. Like I taught myself to knit about 10 years ago, and I know that there were certain things that I needed to have a friend who was a better knitter than me sitting next to me and helping me learn to read my stitches, understand patterns, right? I got feedback that helped me become a better knitter. We too often in education give beginners feedback. And even when there are instructional coaches in schools, they often work with the most struggling teachers. They don't work with teachers who are just trying to get better. So the thing that I started to say is that we usually use instructional coaches to raise the floor, not to um, raise the ceiling. And also a lot of times, even whether you're getting an instructional coach or an administrator feedback, if you are an experienced teacher, they a lot of times don't have much content knowledge to bring to the discussion about your teaching. And there's, there's a really rich intersection of thinking about the mathematics, thinking about kids' understanding, thinking about how we, um, the kinds of things we do pedagogically to help kids get through that content that you kind of need all of those pieces to really dig into. And we don't have that resource here in the U.S. Um, I've worked a lot with some um, school districts in Canada where they do have much more of a culture of math instructional leaders and math coaches. So that's a choice we make in our school system to not support teachers with that kind of expertise but I do think, um, in our experience, the teachers that we worked with were really grateful to get direct feedback about their instruction that involved a lot of delving into the mathematical content, too. So that's a, that's a short list. Um, the, the two things that we found consistently hard for the experienced teachers we were working with was the part of the lesson where once they kind of launched the activity and had the kids working by themselves, either in groups or pairs, Managing that part of the lesson turned out to be thorny and bring up a lot of things that um, warranted a lot more discussion and examination. And then the other piece that's very related to that was when kids are struggling with some mathematics in some way, how to productively scaffold 
their struggle. How to not go too far by over scaffolding and then just basically leading them by the nose of what to do next, Mm -hmm. but also not to be so vague that they start playing that game that I call guess what's in my head. You know, yes, you know what I'm talking yes. about. <laughs> Where they're like, uh, seven, right? You know, and they're like reading your face. Uh, do I square it? You know, <laughs> you're like, no, 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 think about it, think about it. <laughs> so, I think, um, those are some pretty th- that that's what we're going to be exploring in, in the next project that we're starting is really to try to delve into what can we tell teachers about those aspects of math teaching because turns out that those are really, really hard for everybody. Well, absolutely. And believe me, I will be uh, first in line for that book that explains <laughs> what, you know, when and how to give help in that moment of of struggle. Um, because I, I agree yeah. that that is, um, it's just something that you, you'd figure that if you experience it every single day of your life as a teacher, which I do, you'd get really good at it. But, you know, it's just really challenging to know exactly when and how to communicate feedback about, you know, oh, have you thought about this? Or, how do you know, yes, I Absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming and speaking um, uh, about about your book and your research. Um, if anybody hasn't already read Motivated, hopefully they are now motivated to do so. Um, <laughs> I do think that it's a really fantastic book for teachers who are maybe not a first or second year teacher, but they're far enough in that they that they know they've got the baseline down and they're looking for that way to reach the next level of their teaching. And I, I've, I've found it to be um, a really illuminating book um, for people in that situation, which I am. So um, Yay. thank you so much. Thank you, Kent. It's been lovely talking with you. Our thanks to Kent and Lana for their time today. You can learn more about Kent and his work at gamesforyoungminds.com. You can also find him on Twitter at Kent Haynes. Lana can be found on Twitter at Lana underscore Horn, and her book Motivated can be purchased online at Heinemann.com. Learn more and read a transcript of this episode at blog.heinemann.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.